Karibu and welcome to day two of our Sharing Best Practices event for the Tanzanian seaweed industry. This is organised by the Global Seaweed Star Programme, which aims to improve the sustainability of the global seaweed industry and is funded by the UK Research and Innovations Global Challenges Research Fund. Those of you yesterday would have enjoyed uh, presentations from our research leading team. Today we'll hear more from uh, our team based in Tanzania. I would like to direct you all to the question and answer box at the side of your display. Uh, at the top of your team's display, you will see two speech bubbles with a, a question mark in one of them, which will bring up the question and answer box to the right hand side of your screen. If you would like to input questions during the event, we will deal with them during our question and answer session towards the end of, the, of today's session. Um, just some general housekeeping uh, for, for everyone involved. Um, if you are a presenter, if you can remember to keep your microphone on mute uh, during the session, unless you're speaking, of course. And just to remind everyone in attendance uh, that they have the question and answer function uh, and please to put their questions in uh, before the end. Um, in compliance with the GDPR privacy, um, I should let you know we are filming today's session uh, and if you wish to remain anonymous uh, and you are asking a question, uh, you should rejoin the event as an anonymous member and your name will not show up when the questions are asked. Otherwise, uh, you will not appear uh, on today's session, uh, your name or your, or, or, or your image, uh, so we are fully compliant with GDPR in that respect. As I said, we're going to hear from our Tanzanian team, um, but first we're going to hear from uh, Janina Varakal, who is a postdoc researcher at SAMS in Oban, and she is going to present for you now. Thank you. Hello and good day. My name is Janina Brakel. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Scottish Association for Marine Science. It's my pleasure today to present our project results on our endeavors to characterize epiphytic filamentous red algae that are associated to Yukumatuit seaweed farms that we have investigated from seaweed farms in Tanzania. Tanzania is one of the centers of global Yukuma and Kapafaiko seaweed production. For 2019, it reached an estimated production of above 100,000 metric tons fresh weight of seaweeds, equaling 2.8 million US dollars. Cultivation has been initiated in Zanzibar in 1989, with a steady increase of the production in the following years. However, in the early 2000s, production specifically of Kapafaikos decreased with a decreasing profit of seaweed farming. This can be seen in this graph. Um, this trend has not only been unique to Tanzania, but has been seen also in other countries of the Western Indian Ocean, such as Madagascar. These declines have been associated to the occurrence of eye size disease syndrome and to outbreaks of infestation of epiphytic filamentous red algae. In this talk, I will concentrate on the epiphytic filamentous algae. Consequences of an infestation with epiphytic filamentous algae are the reduced growth of eucumatoids and a reduction in the carrageenan and content. Partly it's difficult for the farmers to sell infested seaweeds. And finally, farmers are lacking epiphyte free seedlings to replant a farm after a severe outbreak of these EFAs. Finally, in Tanzania, this has led to a shift from a seaweed cultivation dominated by Kapafaikus to a cultivation dominated by Eucuma denticulatum, which is less susceptible to epiphytic filamentous algae. On a local level, this has also caused the closure of farms. What do we know about epiphytes associated to Kapafaikus and Eucuma farming? A study investigating epiphytes in seaweed farms in Madagascar has documented at different time points of the year red algae of the species complex Polysiphonia and Neosophonia, today known as Melanosamnus, to be present. 
Ultra structure analysis document the ability of the endoepiphyte to penetrate into the host tissue. Image A here shows you a young epiphyte emerging in a button-like structure from the host. Image B shows an older epiphyte segment emerging from the host tissue from a ward immersion. Another report from Tanzania documents epiphytes occurring in seaweed farms from Zanzibar in 2012 during an outbreak of epiphytes. Detected epiphytic taxa are listed here in this table. Besides um, Ectocarpus, a brown alga, and cyanobacteria, again, red algae of the polysiphonia neosiphonia complex were found, found most abundantly and widely spread at different sites. Missing from these studies is an identification on a species level. Taxa of these red algae are morphologically very similar and cannot be, be distinguished by visual features, but require identification by molecular tools. Research questions are thus, which are the key epiphyte species that hamper Capophycus and Hucuma cultivation, and do we find the same or different species between different regions? To investigate this, we organized a sampling campaign in Zanzibar, Onguya in March 2020, where we visited three sites. At these sites, we have recently collected seaweeds that were infested by epiphytes in seaweed farms. We were assisted by local farmers that guided these sample efforts. During the sampling, no severe outbreak has been observed. A similar sampling campaign has also been realized in Madagascar, with the aim to obtain comparative samples. This, for this endeavor, seaweed tissue infested by epiphytes was harvested, about two centimeter long pieces that were preserved in a special preservation buffer for further analysis. Here you can see an image how the preserved host and epiphyte looked. What happened next to these? Our team carefully inspected the sampled material under the dissecting microscope. We picked and individualized eight epiphyte individuals from a single host sample to capture the diversity and to investigate whether we would find the same or different species on one host individual. We recorded for each individual, if possible, a preliminary identification based on the morphology, the mode of attachment, and whether we detected any reproductive structures on these epiphytes. Finally, we also prepared the specimen for molecular analysis. Based on the morphology, we were able to record the following preliminary identification of taxonomic groups. Most abundant were the morph was the morphotype Melanosamnus, confirming the findings of previous studies. Individuals here were all firmly attached to the host. The specimen made up 69.5% of all epiphytes dissected. The other groups were the red algae, such as Herposiphonia, Ceramium, Centroceras, or Gailiella. All these were only loosely entangled or superficially attached to the host. Less than 1% were identified as cyanobacteria, and about 11% could not be identified based on their morphology. Based on the high abundance and the firmly attachment mode, we conclude that Melanosamnus, also in this study, presented the dominant epiphyte taxa. Next, we started a workflow to molecularly identify the dominant morphotype Melanosamnus. For this, DNA was extracted. We amplified the sequence of target markers, here the mitochondrial COX-1 gene and the plastid RBCL gene, and we sequenced these. Finally, the obtained sequence were being compared to a database of sequences of reference species, allowing the identification based on this reference taxa. With this approach, we were able to identify the analyzed specimen as Melanosamnus thailandicus. Melanosamnus thailandicus has been first described from Thailand, where it occurred epiphytical on another red algae, Crassularia.
Also, our sequence was 100% identical to epiphyte specimen isolated from seaweed farms in Malaysia. Currently, more specimens are being sequenced and analyzed. We expect a sequence data set covering all the epiphytes that were sampled in the study, which will allow us a much more in-depth resolution, and we hope to understand better the distribution range of these and potentially other species. The final observation that I would like to share is the documentation of life stages of the Melanosamnus morphotypes from seaweed farms. Here I'm showing a life cycle of this taxafrat algae. There are two similarly looking life stages, um, the gametophyte framed by a red box and the tetrasporophyte framed by a blue box. Based on the presence of reproductive organs, I'm showing here as I'm showing here in these images, we were able to determine um, that 10.3% 10 of all specimens were gametophytes and 13.6% could be identified as tetrasporophytes. To conclude, our data set documents the presence of both gametophyte and tetrasporophyte being epiphytical in seaweed farms in equal proportions, and both were similarly firmly attached to the host. To summarize briefly our findings, we show that the dominant morphotype of epiphytic filamentous algae in seaweed farms in Zanzibar was Malanosamnos. This morphotype was most abundant numerically and based on the firm attachment, it's most probably probable that this was also the most harmful to the seaweed host of all the epiphytes collected. We, molecular, we could molecularly identify a small number of specimen as Melanosamnus thailandicus, a species first described from Thailand, but also found in seaweed farms of Kapafaikus in Malaysia. Malaysia. More studies are needed to reveal the distribution of the species and the connectivity of population between regions. Finally, we could show that both gametophyte and tetrasporophyte are epiphytical in seaweed farms. A limitation of this data is that the specimen were not collected during an outbreak of EFAs and thus still other taxa might be then be present and more work is needed to cover with molecular characterization all the um, specimen collected. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have contributed to this work. I would like to thank you for your attention and your interest in the topic. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Dr. Brachel, who has been working closely with our Tanzanian team. One of which is Mr. Sadok Rusekwa, who we will hear from now. Uh, Sadok is going to present on the morphological characterization of native and non-native eukumatoids. Hi, I'm Sadok Rusekwa. Eric career researcher presenting on the morphological characterization and the distribution of native and non-native ecuma and the Kapafaika species collected in the search sites along the coast of Tanzania. Ecumatoid species bloom the family Solicariaceae, Rhodophyte are among the seaweed species occurring in the marine waters of Tanzania and include the native and introduced ecuma and Kapafaika species. In Tanzania, Five native species of Kimatoids, that is, that is Capafaica salvazi, Capafaica stratus, Ecuma denticulatum, Ecuma denticulatum, and the part, Ecuma particulatum have been reported. Native Kimatoid strains were collected from the wild in Pemba and the Ongoya Isen for the trade in 1930s. However, the industry depends as population were overexploited. Proper use of the, for, of the commercial seaweeds, that is, Ecuma denticulatum, Capafaica salvazi, and Capafaica stratus, were introduced from the Philippines, Tanzania, in 1989 for farming. These introduced strains have now also established population in the world with the Ecuma, in particular, attaching to the rock surfaces. There has been a problem to differentiate between the native and the non native. Ecumatoid species. 
Classification of this species is often based on the observable morphological features like color, shape, structure, and the size. However, classification based on the morphological features can be confusing due to the morphological plasticity of, the, of these such species. As a result, farmers and other stakeholders may not be able to tell precisely the species being cultivated. Currently, most seaweed commercially grown by farmers in Tanzania are the introduced strains of the humatoids. These crops are exported to France, Denmark, USA, Spain, Chile, and China, where they are used as a source of collagen. The industry employs more than 25,000 farmers, more than 80% are being women. High temperature surfaces affect the growth of the seaweeds. With the maximum growth of temperature requirement for tropical seaweed species range from 25 to 30 Celsius. According to the temperature records for the Bersam coast for the first past years, the temperature in the region has been increasing, and in some months during the hot season, the mean monthly temperature was about 31 to 34 Celsius, the temperature that is above the optimum for the algal growth. In Tanzania, high sea surface temperature has been reported to affect the farm the seaweed, especially Capafica salvazi, and the causing disease that is ice, ice disease and die off and the lower production. The effect of ice ice has reduced the production of the seaweed from 17 tons thousand to 10 thousand tons from 20, 20, 2015 to 2020. Here are two, two seaweed, first of all, the, the top one, the diseased seaweed, it did crater, and the one from the, on the bottom, the health seaweed, it did crater. The aim of the study was to collect, identify, and characterize humatoids occurring in the search sites of the coast region of Tanzania using both morphological and molecular features. It was also trying a trial cultivation of the humatoid strain collected from the start size and to, to, to characterize their commercial variability, especially by assessing the collagen yield and the quality. This work is conducted with the intention of updating and increasing our knowledge of the humatoid genetic resources in Tanzania also helping farmers to identify species with the high productivity and the resistance to disease that might have potential for the commercial farming in the change of the coastal environment. In this presentation, I will be presenting on the work which dealt with morphological characterization of nematoids in Tanzania with some preliminary results from the molecular characterization. Nematoids samples were, were collected from 15 areas covering the north and the south coast mainland of Tanzania as well as Zanzibar Island. The lead do dot is this one indicates the site where we collect seaweed samples. Collections were made from wild sites, especially from areas where Ikimatoes were previously collected based on literature review and herbarium records, as well as from seaweed farms that is Mwamban, Tanga, Ngoni and Pajan in Zanzibar. An opportunist harvest sampling test was used during sampling. Third work was learned between, between March and September 2020, while also collecting other macroalgae species for the barrier update. Collected samples were stored in the plastic bag, and each sample was given a unique number for identification. A small part of the each sample was stored in the silica gel for the molecular work. The rest of the specimen were placed on the barrier sheet for the taxonomic study as, and as the vulture to, for depositing the inverse of the sum of the barrier. Identification were made according to the morphological features such as color, shape, structure, and the size. Comparison with the specimen deposited at the, at the herbarium of, of Universal Univers of Dessa, we are done. Also, we use the field guide book to identify the specimen. A total of 30 equimatory species were collected from 15 sites. Based on the morphological features, 
three hematoids, that is two Ekuma species and the one Capaficus species were tentatively identified. The morphological identification was compared with the preliminary result from the molecular analysis based on COX-1 and the COX-2-3 spices markers. Ekimatidquatum is one of the species that were identified. As mentioned earlier, Ekimatidquatum is commercially referred as Ekima spinosum. That name is the trade name. Local farmers use the name spinosum or Manu Mbamba when referring to this species. Native is native seeds of E. e dedicratum were reported in Tanzania before the introduction of the exotic E. dedicratum. Native E. dedicratum has previously been reported at Sume, Fumba, Komonda and the Kwari Islands, Budia Island and the Kigomba, Kigombe Ntanga. Morphological features of E. dedicatum. The, the human dedicatum has strange thalas forming a losing cushion, and the branch are covered with the spine like branchless. The interspace between the hole are filled up with the spine, and the original arrangement becomes obscured. In this study, native and introduced E. dedicatum were differentiated based on the different color pattern that is brown, green, and red. Blanching pattern were also used as morphological features in identification, with the angle between an X and a lateral blanch for farmed e dedicatum were wider than for the e dedicatum, that is, the, the, than for the white e dedicatum. Molecular identification again were used to identify E. dedicatum. According to the preliminary molecular result, all, all specimens of the E. dedicatum quoted in the present study belong to the wild cultivated hap, haplotype E13 that is introduced to Tanzania from South Asia in 1980. In this study, samples of exotic E. dedicatum were quoted in widely from Soma, Kwari, Mbudia, Mafia, as well as from farm site that is Mambani, Paje, and the Mungon. Again, we made to identify Ikuma platicladum. Ikuma platicladum was first described as, but described in 1989. The species is native to Tanzania, and it has been reported in different parts of the country including Chukwan Beach in Zanzibar and the Musasani Bay in Dar es Salaam since 1969. That is according to the Herbarium records. In this study, the specimens were found at Komonda Island, Pangavin Island, Mnalan and the Opang Reef, all sites that the species had the, the, the species has not been reported before. The Morphological features of the Kima platicladum they have the flattened thallus, thallus and some regular constriction. They have tooth like branchless and are distributed mainly along the edge of the thallus and on the thallus surface. We find that there are a lot of tooth like structure, branchless. During sampling, at some sites, the species were was found exposed to sun and affected by grazers, as seen in the samples of, of E. particularum from Soma, such that the physical appearance was different from an grazed material of E. particularum, as seen in the same from Pangavin. Here are two samples that were collected from the different sites, but you find the, the by observing, by physical, by morphological obs observation, you can find that there are two different species. So, morphological features of unglazed material E. platicladum from Pang Pangavin were also consist consistent with those described for the E. odontophora, making now dif making making identification difficult based on the morphological one. So. We first we first did problem in identification and identifying the two 
two samples. But using molecular identification, the specimen confirmation was later assisted by preliminary molecular research, which confirmed that the specimen is Ecuma platycladum. We managed also to collect the Capophycus albazi, and the Capophycus albazi was initially described as Ecuma albazi, but later on again it was renamed as Capophycus cotoni by seaweed farmers. It was not named by seaweed farmers, but it was named by as Capophacus albazi by Leao, but in Tanzania it is referred as Capophacus cotoni, but and that is the, the, how the, the seaweed farmers call the Capophacus cotoni. But the native K albazi was reported in Tanzania before the commercial strain were, were introduced from Philippines. And now, according to the literature and the herbarium review, it has been found in the Tumbe, Fumba, Kwale, and the Quarter Islands. This one, this, the, the, the picture of the Kapafika Cyberzi that we have from Komonda Island. The morphologi morphological features of Kapafika Cyberzi, the thalus is cushion like, they have a cushion like. Cylindrical and covered with what like papilla and the form intermediate branches. Young branches are delicate with no papilla and the branching is irregular. The native E, the native of Capophycus reversi thallus, may be more covered with what like papilla than in the exotic strain. A feature that this now is the, is the feature that can help farmers when they differentiate between the two, the native one and the exotic Brazil. Therefore, molecular identification again helped to identify the Capophycus Brazil from the preliminary molecular result indicate that the collected sample is Capophycus Brazil, the isolate of E130, and the report to be the native to Africa. The species were collected to one, at one size in the world on Komonda Island. During this study, the species was not found at several sites where it was previously reported from the literature review and the herbarium records. Our plan is to visit, to visit this site again. Three species were found, that is human and platinum, that is introduced strain, Ecuma platycladum and Capophyca cerebrazi, that is the native strain. It was found that the combination of both the morphological and the molecular features is necessary to differentiate between the eclectic species such as E. denticulatum and the E. platycladum, as well as between the native and the cultivated strain of the same species. Future work to visit other sites like Quata and the tomb where ecumatoids had been previously reported in the literature and the herbarium review that we, in that, that we did not exist in the study. And in, in, the, in the different season again, it is needed to, to look further for native ecumatoids. Because we, when we are making this, we plan to visit all sites in different season. But in some sites we visit only once, and another site we visit we visit twice, so we need to revisit and revisit so that we can find either if there is any species of ichimatoids. It is also possible that the abundance and the distribution of the native ichimatoid species might be a change in both the environmental condition or human activity that has been taking place in the place in the sites where they were reported before. Thank you for listening. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Mr. Rusekwa. We will now hear from one of our other early career research researchers from Tanzania, Ivy Matoju. Good morning. 
I'm Ivy, and I'm going to be presenting a talk on the resilience of farmers by looking at the challenges faced by seaweed farmers and the measures that they take to cope in Tanzania. This is based on findings of work package for the project that looked at the socioeconomic aspects of the seaweed value chain in Tanzania. The information was collected on both mainland Tanzania and the islands of Zanzibar. Thank you. Coastal communities in the United Republic of Tanzania are often reliant on marine resources for their livelihood, be it as a form of tourism, be it fishing, oyster hunting, the collection of different seafood species, and seaweed farming. The farming of seaweed has been part of the community's activities since the mid-80s, when farming techniques were introduced by Professor Mshigeni. Key features of the seaweed industry in Tanzania include the high number of women currently involved in the cultivation of seaweed. This is, this is in spite of the fact that men were also present in equal numbers initially. Stakeholders in the seaweed value chain range across different age groups, and previous studies have also reported on the increase of the presence of the youth within the industry. Current statistics place seaweed farmers at 31,000 people distributed among the islands of Zanzibar and along the coastline of mainland Tanzania. Seaweed farming occurs predominantly within the shallow water areas of the ocean with farmers practicing off-bottom farming using pegs and line. The importance of seaweed farming to the communities lies in the fact that it is central to the production of a valuable extract, carrageenan, which has uses in multiple industries. Seaweed grown in Tanzania is harvested, dried, and exported. In Zanzibar particularly, seaweed farming is the third highest contributor to the economy, following tourism and clothes trade, and the largest marine export product, contributing to 90% of the marine export earnings in Zanzibar. Seaweed farming is a livelihood alternative, providing employment and income for some of the marginalized communities, particularly among women. It has led to the improvement of living standards through better housing shelters, increased ability to educate the children, and generally catering, catering to their daily needs. Seaweed farming is greatly dependent on nature. The pegs that the farmers use to hold their lines are wood, are wood based, while farming takes place in the open ocean, exposing it to elements both land and water based. Farmers face biological hazards in the form of increased disease outbreaks, which are excavated by the low quality of planting materials, farming methods, and biosecurity issues. Diseases and pests, such as ice ice and epiphytes, are leading concerns for farmers especially as there has been a notable increase in their occur the occurrence in recent times. Due to the failure of the native species, farmers cultivate imported species mainly from the Philippines, which are of limited variation. Limited variation and continuous propagation using the same seed increases vulnerability to diseases and pests. The location of seaweed farms in shallow waters directly exposes them to hot spells and the increasing sea temperatures. Rising temperatures are both observed and predicted in Eastern Africa, and the impact is that farmers are increasingly facing environmental hazards and stresses that negatively affect yield. The environmental conditions necessary for ideal yield and optimum production include temperatures of approximately 24 to 30 degrees Celsius and flowing water that allows for nutrient transfer. Any changes in these conditions lead to decrease in yield. Farmers also face less than ideal market conditions. Downstream processing for carrageenan extraction happens entirely outside Tanzania, leaving the farmers dependent solely on the price paid by exporters for dried seaweed. Current cultivation has also shifted towards Yukuma, 
which is seen as more robust with regards to coping with the cultivation condition changes, however, is less economically valued when compared to copper ficus, meaning that the income generated will be lower. International competition from other higher volume producing countries also plays a role in the earnings of the farmers in that the countries are closer to the main markets for seaweed, unlike Tanzania, which has to account for higher transportation costs. All this coupled, is coupled to the fact that the farmers themselves also consider the prices to be lower than the effort that they put in to produce the seaweed. Farmers look within their means to cope with the challenges that they face. They may employ farm maintenance procedures whereby they inspect their crops for diseases or signs of grazing, weeding out encroaching plants and removing contaminants such as items which have washed in with the tide and tangled with their ropes. In some instances, farmers may perform early harvesting if they note a situation developing that may lead to the loss of the crop. They also practice relocation where they move their lines from areas that are either infested by pests or seem to foster the development of diseases. Normally, this relocation is within the shallow waters and it is aided by the fact that there are no restrictions with regards to accessing and using planting areas. Some employ the wait and see approach whereby they wait out the challenge and make changes accordingly if it means replanting or relocation. Farmers can wait out a growth cycle either partly or it's an entirety. This is the common strategy employed, especially in light of climatic changes. Another strategy is the alternative sourcing of, the in of inputs, particularly the cuttings used for propagation. Farmers will use other cuttings, mostly from neighbor farmers for cultivation if their crop has failed. It is not a formal and economic transaction, but it relies on a com on communal sense of assistance. To cope with the lower generated income, farmers practice diversification of their livelihoods, such as also for operating land-based farms, such as agriculture, having low skill level employment jobs, and running small businesses. They also branch out and try to add value to produce seaweed through the production of seaweed-based soaps, body creams, and food products, thereby diversifying their generated incomes by entering the processing market. In some cases, farmers may choose to suspend farming for a time period and take it up later. This was noted by the informants during the study, as they mentioned that Seaweed farmer numbers fluctuated due to the challenges they due to the challenges they faced, be it environmental or financial. As you can see, the strategies aid the farmers to a certain extent, but they come with their own set different set of limitations. The employed strategies aid the farmers. However, their shortcomings may hinder their suitability and sustainability. For instance, farm maintenance for the farms in the shallow waters is restricted to the time frame provided by the low tide. As in essence, it means that the farmer will then either have to hire or request additional help or carry out their farm maintenance in phases. With the relocation strategy, it introduces a limitation in that the shallow waters of the sea are becoming oversaturated with farm lines. This is increasing tensions between the farmers and other, other users of marine resources such as the fishers and tourists. Additionally, the oversaturation of farms within the waters may have impact on nutrient transfer. Relocation to deeper waters is reliant on the farmer's ability to swim and to access boats, which is not easy for the farmers, particularly for the women 
who more often than not are unable to swim and their access to boats is only through their spouses. The wait and see approach creates a condition or an environment which may allow for diseases to spread and potentially carry over to the next growth cycle, especially when farmers preserve cuttings for the next cycle of planting. With seeking alternative cuttings, there is no guarantee that the alternate cuttings are not contaminated and currently asymptomatic, as there is no way to be able to determine the quality of the cuttings. With value addition, the products are produced in small volumes and with a small proportion of seaweed in their formulations. This means that the impact of these products on expanding spinosome seaweed market has been minimal. To effectively bolster the resilience of the farmers and ensure that the strategies that they employ are favorable, they need to be support for the farming industry. The government has taken note of the importance of seaweed farming through the development of the Seaweed Strategy Plan of 2005 and more recently the call for fostering blue economy in the country of which seaweed is a leading part. For the seaweed industry to attain its potential, there is a need to strengthen the production aspect and this means increasing the resilience of farmers in the face of climatic change. Currently, there are forms of social support in place in the form of cooperatives, which correspondent state provide them with advantages such as accessing financial support, but even these networks must be backed up by strong institutional and financial governmental support to be effective. Therefore, to, de to develop, there are certain measures that are needed such as the development and implementation of regulations and policies that are tailored to the seaweed industry that will aid in accessing of inputs and finance for the, by the farmers and in, which will enable them to strengthen their capacity to cope with the challenges that they face. Another measure is the promotion and support of better farming technologies and techniques. For instance, to cope with the challenges of increased water temperatures and disease outbreak, the move to deeper water is seen as an ideal alternative for an, or an ideal strategy. And one, some of the ways that this strategy could be supported is by offering access to boats or swimming less, and or swimming lessons to the farmers to enable them to be able to implement such strategies. Another way is through the incorporation of research findings into actionable plans to improve the industry, such as the establishment of seed banks, which would see that we should see farmers having access to quality controlled inputs and processing plants, which would increase the market that farmers are able to sell the output to. Another measure is, is improving market access one for the farmers by ensuring fair pricing for their raw dried seaweed and to improving the access of value added products by establishing standards of quality. Products with a mark of quality have, a, have the potential to enter markets not only domestically, but regionally and internationally. This will mean that the markets will grow, markets for these products will grow and which will in turn trickle down to improving the market to which farmers can sell their product to, apart from only the export route. In conclusion, taking the measures currently employed by the farmers and strengthening them by eliminating their shortcomings or introducing viable measures that deal with these challenges and establishing a more inclusive support system will greatly increase the resilience of farmers. And this in turn will contribute to the goal of fostering the blue economy nationally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Matoju, for that interesting presentation. 
And we're now going to hear again from Mr. Rusekwa, who's going to present on the seaweeds of Tanzania. Hi, I'm Sadu Rusekwa, Air Career Researcher, present on the checklist of the seaweeds of Tanzania based on the historical and the contemporary collections in the University of Dresam Aga Hebaria. Up to 428 species of seaweeds have been imported in Tanzania. They occur across the three divisions of seaweed that is Rhodophyta, Chlorophyta, and the Phyophyce. They are distributed between high and low tide levels as well as subtide regions. Rock beaches often have the greatest diversity of seaweeds. Some native seaweeds, such as Ivory Squatter, have a commercial value for, for the purpose such that they are used as fish bite, animal feed, and a traditional medicine. The red seaweed that is unfurled jida is used for decoration. Strains of the Ichumari Squatter, Capophycus Rivazi, and the Capophycus Chiata were introduced from Philippines in 1989 and are now the most common commercial farm in Tanzania. The coast climate of Tanzania is described as dry and wet and wet warm, with the temperature range is usually from 22 to 30 Celsius. The main rainy season is March to May, and the short rain rains normally occur in October to December. The coolest time for the coast region is June to September, and during this time the macro algae species are more diverse. High temperature affect the growth of the seaweed with the maximum growth temperature requirement for the tropical seaweed specimen species that is from 25 to 30 Celsius. According to the temperature records for the swamp course for the past 30 years, the temperature in the region has been increasing. In some months during the hot season, the mean monthly temperature was 31 to 34 Celsius, that is above the optimum for the algal growth. Increased temperature may affect the abundance and distribution of some of macroalgae species. The herbarium of Universal Dresam was established since 1965. It is located at the Botany Department and it served the purpose of storing specimen of plants, macroalgae, and, and have been ported and have been that have been collected, pressed and dried. These specimens are an important source of the information for the future studies. And they provide data that can that can be used in scientific work such as taxonomy, speech diversity and distribution. Specimens already placed in the herbarium include seed producing plants and the seedless producing plants. Specimens that have not been databased include bryophytes, fungi, regions, and microalgae. Currently, the herbarium contains more than 240 microalgae species. A variety of microalgae species have been collected since 1967 by researchers including Jason, Michigan, and Brill. Specimens were not yet databased and some have not been well kept. A check that indicated the specimen held in the barrier is available to users but is not up to date. Now the check is the is available to the herbarium users as a hard copy on the cover door indicating specimen stored, stored and the taxonomic, taxonomic, taxonomic information such as family, phyla, genus and the species name. The aim of the study was to review the specimen of the macroalgae current held in the barrier, collected since 1967, and update the checklist of the specimen available. It was also to explain the current collection of the macroalgae in the barrier through review through new field work from along the coastal regions of Tanzania. It was also aimed at creating the database of macroalgae specimen available in the University of Dresden Herbaria for the online access. Now, in review of the existing collection of microalgae at the University of Dessa, all specimens were reviewed, reviewed based on the phylum, family, genus, species name, 
out the correctors set where the specimen were protected and date of production as well as collection number. Here are some of the of, of, of herbarium vouchers that indicate the seed that were protected in long time ago. A total of 332 specimens were found in the barrier classified in green, red, and the brown macroalgae. Specimens were grouped in seven families of Ochrophyta, 12 families of Chlorophyta, and 20 families of Rhodophyta. Specimens had been collected from different sites in Tanzania, as well as, uh, as North Carolina and Hawaii and Canada. All specimens had been identified using morphological features without a molecular characterization. Therefore, some were on a different genus level. The herbarium checklist has been updated to show all specimens had and uh, improving users' access. This is the example of the checklist that has been prepared. In order to expand the herbarium collection, the GSS team at the University of Dyson visited 17 sites along the coast region of Tanzania to, co to collect different species of macroalgae, including sites that including sites that were previous collection where we are done to see whether the species are still available. Now the the red dot again indicated the the size where we got samples that is from Mambani, Tanga to Sin Islands. An optimist Harvard sampling technique was used working from the upper intertidal zone to the upper subtidal zone but it perpendicular over to the shore. Sampling was conducted from March to September 2020. Here are varieties of samples of specimens that were collected from the field. Collected samples were pressed on the barrier sheet and dried. Identification was made based on the color, shape, structure, and the size. Comparison was made again with the specimen previously deposed in the inverse of the assembly barrier and using the field get books to identify the species that were collected. More than 350 specimens were collected across 17 sites in Tanzania. These specimens were classified in phylum, chlorophyta, rhodophyta, and biophyta, and they were grouped again in five families of chlorophyta, 17 families of chlorophyta, and 12 families of rhodophyta. All specimens collected were added to the herbarium checklist. Here are some of the samples of herbarium voted that we have prepared last year. In this study, we observed a potential changes in distribution of macroalgae species reported in Tanzania. For example, why Ikima Red Quartam was collected from Mbudi Island in 1967 and at Kigombe in Tanga in earlier studies, the species could no longer be found at this site. Other species not detected in this study site include Digitomaria Renta, Glacialinoctis, Longsema, and Kerepa, Chemtizia. And there are a lot of specimens that species that were called that, that just mentioned few. In some cases, changes in distribution may be due to different human activities such as fishing, harvesting of microalgae for different uses, swimming, boating that have been taking place in this site, and also an increased temperature above the optimal required range may be cause of the disappearance of such. In creating the online database of the Inversal Dersam collection, the say that the, the database that is going to be that has been prepared, the database will contain details of information on seaweed specimen held in the Inversal Dersam collection. That is the, more than the herbarium checklist. Specimen information compared includes collection, collection coordinates, collection number, collection ID, record number, taxonomy classification, original name, and certificate name, and the 
the authorship the one who had found the speech. The name of each macro act was checked against the act base, and some scientific names were updated if they had changed since the original identification. Validation of the database was done on the GBIF. The database will be approved online for the wide, wider users' access. The data set created, created contains distribution of records of 172 species of macro called since 1967 after the field work conducted in this study. Approximately 8% of the species belong in the phyla, chlorophyta, and the rhodophyta, while only 20% belong to the phyla, chlorophyta, that is, in kingdom chromista. Approximately 17% of the records represent the family Rhodomelas I, while 8% the, 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 the family Dictators I, and the 70% the family Sagas I. The dataset covers record quality from the different sites in Tanzania along the western part of the Indian Ocean, that's from Rind to Zanzibar Island and those brought from North Carolina, Hawaii, and Canada. The data set prepared is in the final stage to be published for online access to share the information about the macro species in Tanzania and worldwide. Here is the sample of the data set that has been prepared. The CVD collection at the University of Bessam Herbarium has been reviewed and expand as a source of for future users. An update checklist of the seaweed specimen held in the herbarium of the University of, uh, of, the of, the of Dresden and those carried in the wallet is now available to improve users' accessibility. A detailed database of the herbarium specimen has been produced and will be approved for the online access such that information on the seaweed flora of Tanzania will be accessible to stakeholders worldwide. Thank you for Thank you. Thanks again to Mr. Rusekwa. We're now going to hear from Dr. Flora Nsuya and PhD student Mr. Masafiri Ndawala on the impact of seaweed diseases on growth and quality of capophagus and leukemia. Hello to you all. Um, this is uh, my presentation, uh, the first presentation in this uh, webinar today. Um, I'm going to present on effect of diseases and the biosecurity practice on seaweed growth and equality in Zanzibar, Tanzania. Tanzania is among the top producers of eucumatoid seaweed in the world. But uh, recently, the industry has faced the challenge of climate change, the increase in seawater temperatures, which have re resulted in occurrence of seaweed diseases and the epiphytes, and these have caused decline in seaweed production. Uh, this graph here shows the, the decline in seaweed uh, production in the last five years. Uh, so in, in, in 2015, we had uh, um, 17,000 tons uh, dry weight of, of seaweed produced, but this, this production has gone down to only 10,000 uh, uh, tons. And this is a, a really sharp decrease in, uh, in seaweed production. Um, the overall objective of our study was to look at the effect of diseases and the biosecurity measures on growth and the quality of Eucuma denticulatum and the Capophagus alivarezae in Tanzania. Our specific objectives were to determine uh, the effects of prominent seaweed diseases on growth rate, carrageenan properties, and the approximate composition of the two uh, seaweed species, Eucuma denticulatum and Capophagus alivarezae. 
Our other objective was to look at the effectiveness of biosecurity measures in controlling diseases outbreak in seaweed farming. And these two were combined with uh, another objective of looking at the influence of uh, environmental parameters of temperature and salinity uh, on the um, parameters uh, mentioned above and the species mentioned above. Uh, we conducted our study uh, in Mongoni village uh, on the southwest coast of, of Zanzibar. Uh, in this area, both Capaficus and Yukuma are cultivated. So we could work with both species. And we conducted biosecurity practice of cleaning uh, the seaweed lines, to shake the seaweed lines and remove uh, sediment and the other unwanted uh, material. We had two setups, uh, one sentinel farm, where we practiced the, the biosecurity measures and the uh, conventional farm where we did not clean uh, the seaweed. This is uh, how the farmers also do it. And uh, uh, the, the farmers normally do not uh, clean the seaweed uh, and we, we treated the conventional farm the same way. Um, and in each sentinel and conventional farm, we had uh, three replicates. And uh, in each replicate, we had seven seaweed lions. We conducted our study in two seasons, uh, during the cold season between August and October 2020, and during the hot season, February to March 2021. And we measured the environmental parameters of water temperature and salinity using the instruments shown here. We calculated uh, the, seaweed, the prevalence of uh, seaweed diseases as the number of affected bunches divided by total number of bunches times 100. So we expressed the prevalence in percent. And we calculated the seaweed growth rate um, SGR as um, 100 times natural log of um, final weight of, of initial weight and divided by time taken for the seaweed to grow. Um, we measured the, the biomass uh, in fresh weight uh, and we calculated is the difference between initial and the final weights uh, and expressed in uh, uh, grams per square meter per day. On um, carrageenan properties, uh, we measured native carrageenan yield uh, and we calculated uh, it as in Hayashi et al. in 2007 and uh, expressed as, uh, as percent. And uh, on Karadin and gel strength, uh, we determined this by a modified uh, texture analyzer according to Burio et al. Uh, of 2001. Uh, approximate composition, we, 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 we analyzed all the the approximate contents uh, by using the methods of Allen uh, 1989. Our results were as follows. On environmental parameters, uh, we found that the temperature and salinity differed significantly between hot and cold seasons. This is when we, we, we did one-way ANOVA um, at P is less than 0 0.05. And throughout this presentation, the, civic, the significance will be based on a, uh, P is less than 0 0.05. Uh, this graph here shows the um, temperature uh, between cold and, and hot season. In the cold season, the temperature uh, maximizes at close to 28 degrees Celsius. And in the hot season, uh, the temperature maximizes at above 31 degrees Celsius. So different difference between cold and hot season. For salinity during the cold season, salinity maximized at uh, close to 34 uh, parts per thousand. Um, and during the hot season, the salinity maximized at close to 36 uh, units of, of salinity. Um, on disease prevalence, growth rate and biomass, uh, we found that in the sentinel farm, um, the, there was significantly lower disease prevalence 
than in the uh, conventional farm. Also, uh, growth rate and the biomass yield were higher in the uh, sentinel than conventional farm. Uh, this table here shows the uh, uh, Capaficus alvarezae show, uh, on sentinel farm and conventional farm. So what we see here is that the disease prevalence is uh, much higher, in, is much lower in the sentinel farm compared to conventional farm. For example, in the sentinel farm, uh, disease prevalence was 17%, while in the conventional farm, uh, prevalence was 34%. Uh, percent. Uh, and this was the case during the cold season and the, and the hot season. Uh, and also growth rate and the biomass yield were higher in the sentinel farm compared uh, to the conventional farm. And the Yukuma denticulatum also, uh, the same thing is seen with higher prevalence of diseases in the conventional farm than the sentinel farm. Uh, and the growth rate and the biomass yield being higher in a sentinel farm than uh, conventional farm in both cold and hot seasons. On effects of diseases on carrageenan yield and gel strength, carrageenan yield and gel strength of healthy seaweed were significantly higher than uh, those of, uh, of diseased seaweed. And this was uh, uh, so in both uh, species and uh, in both uh, cold and hot seasons. Uh, these gra graphs here show uh, the, the uh, carrageenan yield. Uh, in the cold season, you can see here Capaficus salvarezae on the right, distinct uh, values of disease and, the, and the healthy uh, seaweeds. And the same is for Yukuma denticulatum here on the, on the left, distinct um, values uh, of the yield between uh, disease and healthy seaweed. Uh, during the hot season, it was the same uh, situation. Capfaecus elevaris and the Yukuma denticulatum, uh, the, the yield was, uh, uh, was uh, lower in the diseased seaweed than the healthy seaweed. On, on gel strength, uh, during the cold season, we see, we see here uh, graphs showing distinct difference between diseased and healthy uh, seaweed, and this is the case for both uh, Capaficus and the, and the Yokuma. In the hot season also, we see uh, the same uh, uh, thing. Um, the, the Capaficus alvarezae and Yokuma denticulatum, the gel strength is uh, uh, lower in the uh, disease compared with the uh, healthy seaweed. When we look at the uh, um, proximate composition, we see that there was significant difference in some proximate compositions between health and the diseased seaweed. This table here shows the, um, the compositions, Capaficus salvarese and Yukuma denticulatum. So uh, these values that are in red are the ones that are significantly uh, different. We see here uh, in Capaficus salvarese, uh, the significant difference between health and diseased uh, seaweeds was in crude protein, crude fiber, and the uh, total uh, soluble uh, carbohydrate. And in Yukuma denticulatum, it was on uh, um, uh, lipids and the uh, uh, carbohydrates. So what can we conclude from, from our study? We conclude that farm-based biosecurity measures minimize the prevalence of seaweed diseases uh, improving growth rate, biomass yield, and the quality of Capaficus salivarezae and Yukuma denticulatum. We also con conclude that seaweed diseases significantly affect growth, carrageenan yield, and gel strength in both species and the, and the seasons. Uh, we conclude also that during the hot season, disease prevalence is higher and the growth rates are, are lower. And also we conclude that Capaficus is affected more than Yukuma. Our last conclusion is that uh, seaweed diseases affect some of the proximate components, protein, fiber, and carbohydrates in Capaficus salvarezae, and the lipids and carbohydrates in uh, Yukuma denticulatum. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again for that excellent presentation. Um, I think at this juncture in today's session, I would just like to remind you all that uh, the question and answer uh, function is, is available. Um, I'll, I'll say this is the last call for questions before we get, get towards the end of the session. Um, again, if you look at the, the icon at the top of your screen, it will have two speech bubbles, one with a question mark in it. And in there you can submit questions to any of our speakers or if you have a question in general about the seaweed industry uh, in Tanzania or indeed globally, um, you have the opportunity to ask. Um, much of what you've heard today uh, was work that went towards the um, seaweed diseases manual uh, that was launched yesterday, uh, which was a major, major outcome from the Tanzanian element of, of this project. I'd like to move on now. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Nsuya again uh, on fouling organisms on Capophycus and Eukema farms. Hello again to you all. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, in this second day of the, of the webinar on uh, sharing best practices for our Global Seaweed Star project in Tanzania. My name is Flower Msuya and I'm going to talk to you about the microorganisms that foul our seaweed farms in Zanzibar, Tanzania, to look at what are actually the types of microorganisms that foul seaweed farms in Zanzibar, Tanzania. Um, as in the introduction, fouling can be defined as the accumulation of unwanted material on solid surfaces. This is a simple uh, definition of, of fouling. Uh, fouling can be in many forms, such as biological, which we call biofouling, chemical, corrosion, precipitation, and so on. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the biological fouling, that is biofouling. We can define biofouling as accumulation of microorganisms, plants, algae, or small animals, where it is not wanted on surfaces. And this is the definition according to Wikipedia. Uh, worldwide, seaweed farms face the challenge of fouling uh, from uh, macroorganisms, from macrophytes and macrobenthos. We have reports of kelp farms being fouled by bryozoans. We have reports of red seaweed farms like Gracilaria being fouled. We have reports of the green seaweed farms also being fouled. And actually, biofouling is one of the major challenges and constraints in the seaweed aquaculture industry worldwide. Usually, um, biofouling is seasonal and the types of organisms uh, differ according to, to, to season. The, the fouling microorganisms interfere with photosynthesis. They compete for light, nutrients and the other resources with the cultivated seaweed and so they interfere with the growth of the seaweed. They can cause the seaweed to break. For example, in, if they are entangling the seaweed and the entangling is, is, is severe, the seaweed will break off and the biomass uh, will be lost. They also cause mortality of the cultivated seaweed, uh, in both cases causing big losses in the seaweed industry. Examples of uh, fouling microorganisms include wild seaweeds, gastropods, bivalves, bryozoans, and so on. So when we, we talk of fouling of seaweed farms, Zanzibar archipelago in Tanzania is not an exception. We also face um, the problem of, of, of fouling by microorganisms. The photos on the right show uh, severe fouling by uh, wild seaweed Gracilaria uh, in one uh, village on, on the southwest coast of Zanzibar. So we conducted this study to look at the types of uh, microorganisms that are fouling Eukuma and Capafalcus seaweed farms in Zanzibar. We undertook uh, this study in two seasons. During the cold season between August and October 2020, and during the hot season between February and March 2021. Here I have to say that uh, we didn't really hit the, 
the peak of the cold season and hot season because the peak of the cold season is uh, July, August, and the peak of hot season is January, February. But when we measured the uh, temperatures, the values we got uh, are similar to those that are recorded in, in cold and hot seasons in, in Tanzania. We did our study uh, in Mongoni village on the southwest coast of, of Zanzibar. This is part of a larger study on seaweed farm biosecurity, which you, you, you had uh, in the previous uh, presentation. On materials and methods, the map on the right here shows uh, the position of Mongoni village in the southwest coast of Zanzibar. In this area, uh, the three species cultivated in Tanzania, Yukuma denticulata, Capafica salivarezae, and Capafica stratus are farmed. This gave us the chance of working with both Yukuma and the Capafica. We had two setups. We had a sentinel farm where we were uh, practicing uh, biosecurity, uh, practice of, of cleaning the seaweed, shaking the, the lines to, to remove um, sediment, debris, and the other um, organisms. And we had a conventional farm where we did not do the um, biosecurity practice. We treated it the same way the farmers uh, do, because the farmers normally do not uh, clean the farms. They may clean uh, the farms only once during the whole growth cycle, but normally they do not. So the conventional farm was treated that way. And in each setup, we had uh, three replicates. Um, and in each replicate, we had uh, seven lines, uh, seven ropes holding uh, the seaweed uh, that was growing. We collected the microorganisms by hand um, and placed them in, in zip bags. Uh, and later we identified the organisms in our mini laboratory in the hotel and also at the laboratory of the Department of Botany University of Dar es Salaam. We used the guidebooks, identification keys, and other tools that we could find uh, for the purpose of identification. So what did we find? What are our results? We are calling them preliminary results because we are still analyzing the data. Uh, we saw that the microorganisms can be either attached, they can be entangling, or they can build shelter on the seaweed or live in seaweed farms as a, as a, as a shelter. So uh, on, on macroalgae, we found a, a number of microorganisms um, of macroalgae that were following the farms. The photo on the left hand side, the upper one, that is Padaina growing on a uh, Yukuma thallus. And the one in, on the bottom, the left hand side, that is uh, Kaulepa uh, growing luxuriously attached on, uh, on Kapafikas. And the photo in the middle, the upper one, that is uh, Enteromorpha, which has been renamed Ulva, a mix of Enteromorpha and Ikitomorpha. They are entangling the seaweed. And because the entangling is severe, you see that the seaweed is already breaking. So, and we found um, other species of, of macroalgae. We found uh, like a dictyopter dichotoma and the uh, other species. On macrobenthos, we found uh, a number of, of them also. Um, the photo on the right side, the upper one, that is an uh, oyster growing attached to Capafikas. And the photo on the left, that is a shelter built on um, Yukuma thali. Inside this shelter, you find a number of small organisms, sea lices, insects, and uh, all kinds of small organisms living inside the shelter. And uh, we found the other species of macrobenthos. We even found um, octopus eggs uh, attached on, on Yukuma. If we look at the list of um, macroalgae during the cold season, we found 24 species of macroalgae, uh, which ranged from the greens, um, chlorophytes, to the uh, red ones, rhodophytes, to the brown ones, the phyophacy. So 24 species uh, during the cold season. In the hot season, we found 22 species, which also was a combination of the chlorophytes, 
rhodophytes and the phyophacy. So 24 species during the hot season. Uh, on sea grasses, we found six species in each season of of, of, of sea grass, uh, ranging from uh, from those growing in the upper intertidal area like the halodul, the halophila, to those living in the um, subtidal and tidal um, uh, areas in deeper waters like thalassodendron. So six species in each uh, of the two seasons. On macrobenthos, we found a, a number of uh, uh, gastropods, bivalves, we found things like Cyprea, Lithorhina, Nerita, Teria, and so on. We also found hermit crabs, starfish, and uh, sponges. And we did not find uh, differences uh, in the number of species between sentinel and the conventional farm, number of species. Uh, and uh, we are still analyzing the data. So we did not find a uh, difference in the number of species uh, during uh, the season, the cold and hot season. So what can we conclude from this study? We, we conclude that there is a number of microorganisms that foul Yukuma and the Kapafika seed farms in Zanzibar, Tanzania. We encountered over 20 species of macroalgae, over 10 species of macrobenthos, and uh, six species of sea grasses that foul um, that our seaweed farms. And we did not find a difference between sentinel and conventional and between cold and hot seasons in terms of numbers of organisms. As I said, data is uh, analysis is ongoing. We want to look at the, the types of, uh, of organisms to see if there is a difference uh, and so on. And we wanted to expand our study to cover all four seasons of the year, cold season, hot season, short rains, and uh, long rains. And we also wanted to check the extent of attachment if the microorganisms are penetrating the host or not. That is all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Masuya. Uh, I think it's incredible to have, have that insight into the Tanzanian seaweed farming industry. Uh, at this point in today's session, we'll move on to the question and answer session. Uh, so I'd like to introduce my colleague, Helen Burry, who has been monitoring the questions today. Uh, hi, Helen. Um, would you like to hello, introduce the first question, um, please? Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, just, just before I move on to the questions, I thought it might be useful to just, just highlight this one. Um, uh, Cecile did ask about the availability of presentations. And just to add um, that uh, for everyone, that yes, the, the presentations or the recordings of the sessions will be available on the Global Seaweed Star website, uh, the resources page, hopefully by next week. And you can also access the presentations on the Global Seaweed Star YouTube channel. And Maeve has very helpfully added the links to those to the, the Global Seaweed website there and also the uh, YouTube channel so that the, the as I say the recordings will be available um, on those channels and, and website. So the first question that we received was for Dr. Janina Brakel and the question is I am wondering what what do you think the reason that the EPA is affecting the seaweed what kind of relationship do they have with the host? Hello, good morning everyone. This is Janina. Um, thanks a lot for this question. So for the in first instance, the epiphytes use Capophycus and Hucuma just as a substrate to settle on. For the type of the interaction, we still don't understand this fully. We believe that the interaction is a parasitic interaction based on that the growth of the Hucuma and Capophycus um, seaweeds is reduced. And um, as I showed in my presentation from this ultrastructure um, images, you can see that um, the epiphyte really penetrates into the tissue. Um, however, we don't know whether there's, for example, an exchange of metabolite, metabolites um, between the seaweed host um, and the epiphyte. 
Um, so that's still something um, that we need uh, that needs more further investigation. The second question that we still don't understand fully is how um, specific, how host specific are these epiphytes? Um, as you have seen, heard from my presentation, the species that we could identify from um, seaweed farms um, has also been detected on another red algal species, Gracilaria. Um, so this first data indicates that it's not that host specific, um, but um, more investigation is needed to confirm this. Okay then. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Dr. Brackel. Um, Helen, as that was uh, directly for uh, Dr. Brackel, would you like to move on to the next question? Yes, yeah. The next one is for Ivy. And the question is, I am wondering if you have noted some gender differences in resilience to the risks you identified. How about with regards to the coping stroke adaptation strategies of farmers. Um, Ivy, if you're online, are you able to take that question? If Ivy's not able to to, to take that, um, Flower, are you in a position to, to answer that one? I think you're still muted, sorry. If we have Louise Jackson and perhaps Louise, are you coming on that one? Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I've, we've just had a message from Ivy saying that she can't be heard. I would prefer, if possible, for Ivy to, to answer that question. Um, so maybe we could move on to some of the other questions and come back to Ivy at the end. Sure. And I will. I can. I can also WhatsApp her. Um, just to. Uh, um, she can also WhatsApp the question to me, and then I can. Yeah. I can say that later. We will. We will get an answer some way somehow. Um, okay, Helen, move on to the next question. Okay. Yes, the next question is from Marshall at Seedling and he asks if the seaweed shows sign of deterioration due to high temperature, is there any possibility for them to recover in the farm? Okay. Again, I would anticipate Dr. Masuya able to, to answer that one, but I'm not sure if she's having problems with our with our microphone. Can I help to answer? Yes, please. Yeah. Yep. Just uh, based on our experience, normally it depends on how severe the stress that the seaweed experience. So if the stress level is not too uh, high, if you can move the seaweed to much more uh, better condition for them to grow, they actually can slowly recover. Yep. So it depends the stress level. Okay. I hope. Thank you. Was someone else coming in on that? No. Okay. Uh, no, unfortunately, Dr. Nusia seems to be having um, problems with the microphone at the moment, but as soon as that's working, we'll, we'll bring her in on, on, on some of these points. Um, Helen, have you got the next question for me? Yes, yeah, I, I should add that the next two questions are addressed specifically to Dr. Masua. I okay. can read them um, to see if anybody else is able to answer them. The first one is, do you think the biosecurity is effective to minimise the disease in your farm? And how do you encourage the farmer to do the same measure in their farm? Okay, we're still having the same problems with Dr. Nasuya. Um, 
there's anyone else would like to come in on that one? Can I speak? Can I speak? Yes, please. Okay, do you hear me? We do. Yes, uh, let me respond on behalf of Dr. Msuya. I think uh, according to the results that we have, though they are still preliminary, but I think biosecurity is a, 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 is a, is a measure which can help. As you can see, uh, even in the disease prevalence, it has helped in both seasons to reduce the disease prevalence. But also it has uh, in the Sentinel farm where the biosecurity was undertaken, even the seaweed production, the growth rate, the biomass was a little bit higher than in the conventional farm. Also, it, the biofouling organisms were also higher in the, the same number of species, yes, were the similar. Uh, in both uh, in, in both of the of the farms, but in the sentinel where our security was exercised, there were a little uh, the biomass of the fouling organisms were fewer. So I think uh, it is it is still a tool. It is still a good measure. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barrio, for, for for coming in on that. Um, I I note Helen that the. the the last question that we have on the list at the moment seems to be of a similar vein. I wonder if Dr. Brio is able to, to to comment on that one as well. Yeah, but um, if I can also add on that, that um, you have to, to to also to take a note that during the hot season, for example, we have um, most of the seaweed becomes softer because of the stress. So if you are you are you are you are employing the, the biosecurity measures, you have to be very careful so that you don't uh, fragment the seaweed. So um, also applying the biosecurity measure needs also the understanding of the of the status or the healthiness of the plant. If the plant has so much uh, 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 stressed, then you have to take care during the the employment of the, this, this biosecurity measures, especially don't disturb so much the plant. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Helen, if you if you would like to read that the last question there. Um. Uh, the yes, the, the the there are sorry one more question. As I say, it was directed to Dr. Masur again, and it's based on the result of your bio biosecurity measure in farm. What do you think the cause of, is of the disease? Very very specific question obviously and and we'd love for Dr. Masuya to be to be able to answer that. Um, yes I'm here. Hooray! If you'd like to just take up on that point uh, Dr. Masuya and then we can maybe throw on a couple of quick questions at you. Okay um, the, the the main cause why why the, the 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 diseases are high in the areas where there is no biosecurity? It means that uh, accumulation of the of the fouling organisms, yeah, they can even um, shade the seaweed. They can compete for nutrients. So if you have a lot of those uh, fouling microorganisms, then they compete with the, the they they take the resources away from the growing seaweed. I don't know if I got the the question correctly. <laughs> No, no, and of you. course, I, I can just add on, sorry, because we are same team, I can add on, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, apart from also taking the nutrients and shading, because they are, they are, they are, they are fouling, for example, the bow fouling organisms, which make the, they, they just cover the whole, the whole uh, thallus of the, of the, the plants. They also invade. They also like they they create a, a house for other microorganisms like the fungi. The, 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 the fungi, the bacteria, which can also cause disease, make a vulnerable to the disease. Yeah. But they also soften the tissue of the disease of the surface and therefore uh, create the 
the, 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 the space for optimistic organisms to attack more of their plants. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Barrio. Uh, there, there was a, uh, another question that was uh, directed uh, towards Dr. Nasuya, Helen. What was that other one? Oh, it was, it was for Ivy. Um, and that, that was, I'm wondering if you have noted some gender differences in resilience to the risks you identified. How about with regards to the coping stroke adaptation strategies of farmers? Yeah, I, I would like to give uh, another chance to, to answer that when she's and Louise has managed to get an answer from her. Oh, Ivy? Ah, Louise? Uh, Louise, were you able um, to get were you able to get an answer from Ivy in the in the interim? <laughs> in fact, for me, I also lost the, uh, part of the question because there was like poor internet connection. Sure. But if I just had explained the scenario that I know, uh, know that uh, challenged by farmers. If we come to gender, we find that any technology, for example, moving to deeper waters needs a physical, uh, uh, physical, much of the physical strength. It needs also uh, swimming, know-how. It needs maybe sophisticated equipment like uh, boats and whatever. And all of these facilities and the physical strength, they are not available for women. <laughs> Only men can afford that. And the men, in Tanzania, for example, men are not much engaged in the seaweed farming because I think of the price. The price does not encourage men to 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 involve them. In the in the in the seaweed farming, they they find other options and what and these are activity remains for women as they don't have much of the options. So when we come to resilience, we think. Ah, uh, we need more support on the policies and uh, uh, maybe uh, I don't exactly, but we need more of the recommendation in the policies, in the, uh, 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 insurance, and uh, we need to strengthen that that area of resilience, especially for seaweed farmers. We also need a uh, value addition. Thank you. Uh, is still growing. value added products which can. I I I lost Dr. Bayou there. Yeah, the resilience of farmers. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe I believe mm -hmm. that uh, Louise Jackson has has an answer uh, for the to the question that was directed towards Ivy. So I just wonder if we can bring in Louise Jackson for the moment. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and just to say that I um, I um, have been working with Ivy over the um, time of the of the GS Star project. So I'll just read out what she says, it, which doesn't add much to um, what Dr. Barrio has has just said. She says there is a notable gender difference in the main coping strategy, which is moving to deeper waters, and this is seen as the way forward to coping with increasing temperatures. However, women's access to boats is limited because they're mainly reliant on their spouses having the boats. So this is male ownership of the of the boats um, that women would need to use if they were going to farm seaweed in um, in deeper waters. And she said with the other strategies, there is no notable gender divide. Thank you very much. Um, Helen, have we covered all the questions? Uh, you we, and, we I think have. Flower had her hand up. Flower, was there some, Dr. Monsieur, was there something that you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wanted to add that uh, um, about the, the gender, about men, for example, when we go to realizing that men might uh, take over or might be uh, more than, than the women. So what we do is 
we during our trainings we tell the women to work, we train them in groups of, of women and men so that they can work together they acquire the boats together they, the women can learn swimming and then they work together so this is a strategy that can help to 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 put to keep both gender in the in the in the deep water farming in that uh, seaweed Thank you, Dr. Masia. Um, Helen, is that uh, all the questions covered uh, now? Yes, yes, we, that, that is all the questions covered. Just to add, though, um, we have there is an announcement in the Q&A section to say that if you wish to receive a copy of the manual, Diseases and Pests of Cultivated Seaweeds in Tanzania, then please feel free to get in touch with the Global Seaweed Star Team and there is an email address there and it should also be made available within the next week on the website as well. Um, could you just read out the email address Helen just for those who yes. can't see? Yeah it's global seaweed star at sams.ac.uk. Thank you. Okay, um, if we can wrap up the question and answer session, unless there's anyone who has any more any more comments to make. Uh, we're now going to hear the closing ceremony from uh, Dr. Brio, who, who very helpfully uh, answered some of the questions in the Q&A for us. Um, so if we can hear from her now uh, on the closing ceremony for uh, today's session and indeed the Sharing Best Practice event. Elizabeth Kotia Cook, the principal investigator of GSS program. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, protocol observed. On behalf of the University of Dar es Salaam, I am humbled to give the closing remarks. The participants of this two days workshop organized by UDism with the main objective of sharing best practices among the partner uh, countries of the program and other stakeholders. Uh, I would like to thank the government of the United Kingdom for supporting the program. I would like to thank SAMS, our lead partner for leading the program and in this case I'm very grateful to Professor Elizabeth for leading us, the team at SAMS, Valeria, Sara, Neve, Janina and the rest of the team. I'm grateful to other partners uh, at the Natural History Museum, OD, CEFAS, CEFDEC, University of Malaya, United Nations University. To all of you, I say thank you. I will be unkind if I don't use this opportunity to mention some specific fingerprints of the project at UDISM. In areas of capacity building, this program has assisted the development of individual and capacity building at institutional level. At individual level, the participants underwent uh, different training, including in-country training, abroad training, and they, we have acquired various skills and knowledge through uh, the implementation of various activities of the project. At the institutional level, we acquired funds which has enabled us to run uh, the project activities. Also, we have acquired some research facilities including but not limited to light meter, dissolved oxygen meter, refractometer, microscopes, chemicals and other consumables. In terms of publications, I have to mention several. 
that the program has uh, supported the research activities which has uh, gave out a number of publications. We have, for example, Rusepo et al. 2020, which is already published, Musuya et al. in press. We have a manuscript on Aquaculture Africa already submitted. We have um, a manuscript on the DSM herbarium under development. We have a manuscript on, on the resilience of farmers under, under development. We have a manuscript on morphological characterization of eucumatoid under development. We have a manuscript on fouling organisms under development. We have Tanzanian macroalgae database under development. We have a manuscript on, on eucumatoid diversity molecular characterization. We are also developing the country policy brief. Uh, we have also disease manual, the manual for identifying disease. And this one will be, uh, this one was launched yesterday. And we have also a flyer for farmers, which is an extract of the CBD disease identification manual but in more softer language, which is understandable by the CBD farmers. In terms of new professional networks that have been established, I have to acknowledge that we have been with a lower base on the molecular aspects. And if you look at the publication profiles of ecologists in Tanzania, you will understand that we are really, really lagging behind in terms of molecular aspects. So we are very grateful to this program. It has exposed us to partners who are, very, who are, who are well versed with the molecular aspects. And we have now established networks and individuals whom we can work with. Also in the area of biosecurity, and seaweed disease uh, identification. We are very happy to establish these new professional networks which will help us in the future. Uh, apart from what we have acquired, we still have opportunities. We have areas of priority which we think are important and they are part of our theory of change in terms of the seaweed industry sustainability in Tanzania. So as we are focusing on the sustainability of the global seaweed industry and seaweed farmers resilience, I find that we in Tanzania need uh, to strengthen the listed priority areas and hence we need further collaboration in those areas. First one is the tissue culture. Uh, seed nurseries and production of healthy seeds for farmers. We have to continue efforts on native strains isolation and farming trial so that we can be able to isolate native strains and uh, new species, which we think are being native, they can uh, gradually adapt to the changing environment. Also in the area of innovative farming technologies, we, we need also a collaboration in seaweed value addition. Out of the research and academia, I welcome you all to enjoy the beauty of Tanzania, seeing the big five impressive animals, lion, rhino, leopard, elephant and buffalo roaming freely in their own habitats. With those few remarks, I declare the two-day sharing best practice workshop for GSS program in Tanzania held in October 2021 is now.
Thank you so much, Dr. Berio, for, for your closing remarks. Um, I feel that over the, the two days we've had a tremendous insight, not just to the seaweed farming industry in Tanzania, but we've also had uh, a taste of things to come in the global seaweed industry um, and an, an excellent overview of, of what's happening just now as well. Um, so for myself, uh, Ewan Patterson, the uh, Global Seaweed Star Communications Manager, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank the, the speakers for their time and excellent presentations, for my colleagues working hard behind the scenes, and also to our funders, uh, UK Research and Innovation. So to all of you attendees, wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good night.